My name is Pega Molana and I'm the Commonwealth Youth, Hum Youth Human Rights Democracy Network uh, Partnership and Engagement Officer. So today is a very special day and it also means so much for our network. Human rights and democracy plays a crucial role in our society. We all know it, we all practice it and we all preach it. But before I start the session, I want you all to answer two questions, but with a raise of hands. How many of you have felt included during this chogam? Included during this chogam, your voice. <laughs> Perfect, almost all of you. Now look around yourself and the people who are sitting next to you. How many of you are of opinion that the members of this actual chogun represent the, the society that we all live, the minorities, the disabled, everyone that make the society, the minorities that could mean race, religion, faith? Do you know what I'm on about? <laughs> Do you think that someone sat next to you is different to you? That might be a better question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? <laughs> I definitely can see a different versions of each one of us here. And inclusion means that regardless of our race, religion, and background or even anything that sets us behind from anyone else, we are all equal. And this is what this session is going to highlight. And most importantly, what our panelists are going to show us. But what if I told you that the fact that our society is as diverse as ever, but actually they are not as represented as we would like them to be in decision making, in policies, and even when we want to make collaboration with them. <clears throat> Sadly, this is the barrier that we all face, or what the world has put in front of us. Actually, I don't like the word barrier. I would like to say challenge. It's a challenge that is set before us in order to make our world as diverse and as inclusive as possible. This is what I love about our panelists. They all have done their own part in order to make their society better than they have found it. And this is what inspires me about them. So the good news is today you are going to go through a whole world of ways and motions where you can change your society for better. So equip yourself and prepare as much questions as possible because we are going to start learning on how we can leave our world better than we found it. Actually, not even our world, the communities that you come from. So today, I want to start with the panelists. I want you all to get to know them and specifically prepare questions to, to really, really challenge them a lot. So can I start with actually introducing our panelists? If I start with Ankit, Ankit is an inspirational, young leader who has done a lot about young disabled youth. I'm not gonna go too much into detail because this is his part and I really want him to shine when he introduces himself. After all, we have Samson who has done a lot in advocating for young people to get in involved with decision-making and actually be one of the decision-makers himself. Afterwards, we have Donia. Donia is an inspirational young leader who actually has been doing a lot about LGBTQI in Barbados. And afterwards, we have Daniela. Daniela has provided a lot of knowledge on, so, on, sustain, oh God, on, so, on social development and its sustainable dimension on policies. And last but not least, we have Nikki, who has been advocate for young indigenous women across Canada. So ladies and gentlemen, I will introduce you the most amazing, in my opinion, panel of the day. And Ankit, can you provide, please in two minutes, provide an introduction on the work you do. Sure. So, 
Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> so, hello and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Ankit Garg. I come from India. I work with Standard Chartered Bank as well as I am a very, very proud One Young World Ambassador. So, so before getting into uh, the work that I do back in India, so just wanted to give you a glimpse of my own life and I can relate uh, to the work uh, very well with my personal life. So 28 years back when I was born uh, to a middle class family in rural India, I was diagnosed with a rare degenerative retinal disorder, which is called retinitis pigmentosa, which, which took away uh, most of my vision from me. Uh, but friends, I think I was, I was very fortunate to have got the means and determination to fight my disability. But I don't think a lot of, lot of other friends of mine who have a disability do have those kinds of means. You know, just, just to give you statistics, 15% of the world's population do have a disability in one or the other form. They either are born with a disability or they acquire disability at some later stage in their life. So go, going by this very statistics, you know, one out of every sixth person in this room is going to acquire a disability at some or the other point of time in, my li in your life. And I'm not joking about it. This is, these, these are real statistics. But I think this topic has been very, very underrepresented at, at all forums. So my work was concerted towards helping people at the grassroots level in the rural areas who do not have the means to fight their disability. Most of these people are illiterate. Most of these people do lack basic education and employment opportunities. So what we, how do we go about? Anyways, the formal sector is closed for these people. They don't have jobs. They, they have to confine themselves to within, within their homes because the infrastructure is completely inaccessible and it is, it is true across most of the Commonwealth countries. So how did we go about it? Is that we decided that let's, let's help them do something from the comfort of their homes. Because we, are, we, cannot change, uh, we cannot change mentalities, we cannot change infrastructure overnight, but we really wanted to economically empower, financially empower them. You know, I tell you, the most destructive part of, of being a person with a disability is the loss of self-esteem, confidence, and dignity. And, and we realized that only financial independence could bring that back. So what we decided is that let's, let's invest in the skill development, let's in, invest in the self-employment opportunities for those people. So we went ahead and skilled, we, we identified skills that they can do very well. And to your surprise, let me tell you, we skilled blind people, we skilled people with locomotive disabilities in areas like making handmade soaps and detergents, which are fully organic, I, I will say better than good brands in the market, direct competition to Unilever's of the world, by the way. So, so we skilled uh, people in those areas. We skilled people in running cafes so that something they can do at the comfort of their homes, sell whatever they produce to the local communities and earn a good livelihood for themselves. So th this is precisely the work that I did for uh, the rural community. Additionally, I felt that, you know, uh, since, since I am a part of the corporate world as well, so I, I'm, a, I'm a working member of the Global Disability Network of Standard Chartered Bank, uh, which, which does really amazing work in the area of disability. And I, I, and I am happy to lead certain initiatives at the bank for people with disabilities, how, how we can make the bank the best place for talent with disabilities. So this is precisely the work that I did here. Yeah. Thank you, Auntie. Thank you. It's truly inspiring, and I'm sure everyone already feels that the work you do really needs to be replicated across the Commonwealth, not only the way or the place that you do. And I hope that we take inspiration and we think of uh, transferring that into into the agenda of the Commonwealth. Samson, can you please 
have a short introduction on who you are and what you do. Um, thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Can you just turn to the person on your left or on, their, on your right and tell them politics is everything? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I come, I come from, from Nigeria, and I work uh, on the continent of Africa. And that's a continent that has um, the largest concentration of young people across the world. Mm -hmm. Though the average age of those who lead us on the continent is about 65. And so we who are demographically a majority are politically a minority. And we started Not Too Young to Run, and the Not Too Young to Run campaign is just inspiring young people to get into politics. Because at the end of the day, it boils down to the decision that policymakers make. It boils down to the appropriations and the budgets that our national parliaments make. And so we need to get people, we need to get young people, we need to get diverse groups into the decision-making room. And what we do through Not Too Young to Run is to get young people politically active. And not just young people because they are young, but young people who understand governance, who have competence um, to get into office and use power for our common good. Um, the campaign was launched um, in Geneva in 2016, November, by the United Nations, mm -hmm. as well as um, in, in January of 2017 at, in, in New York, um, also launched by the Africa Union, as well as the Economic Community of West African States. And so what I do is to struggle politically or for the political rights of young people across um, the Africa region. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Again, political or politics always is, surrounds us, regardless of whether we like it or not. And why better reason than us being part of it, or else it gets decided without us. So thank you for your um, introduction. But Donya, you do a lot about LGBTQI. This is a topic that interests all of us, I'm sure, but it's not talked about much. And we really, really are keen to hear on the work you do and hopefully questions that comes arising from it. So please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, my name is Donia and I'm the founder of the Barbados Gays, Lesbians and All Sexuals Against Discrimination. Um, the organization uh, I started, you know, it came from a real deep and dark place where um, I was homeless and I was having a lot of personal issues and I use the issues that I faced to, to help myself and to help other people and other young people who were facing the same difficulties. Um, discrimination in Barbados and homophobia and, and transphobia in Barbados and in the Caribbean and in the Commonwealth often affects young people uh, in, a, in a large way because of course we're vulnerable. And, one of the major issues that we face in the in the Caribbean is homelessness. Is it's uh, we have me mental health issues, and these are all issues that I face personally. And so the organization Be Glad uh, was formed to educate Barbadians. Oftentimes, um, in activism, we work you know within our own silos and within our own communities, trying to empower the communities. And this is very very important. But I believe it needs to be a pincer effect where when we work within the communities, we work with the public as well, because the public needs to be educated and sensitized um, on how we should treat each other and how you know, we should work together. And this is the real premise of Be Glad for public advocacy, education, and sensitization um, just across the board. So we work largely with churches and trade unions and the media. Um, human resource organizations and anybody really that wants to learn more about the community because oftentimes the work that we do and the work that we fight against is based in and the issues that we face is often based in ignorance so we need to educate uh, the population um, first to change attitudes and to change behaviors so that we live in a harmonious society and I believe this issue is a developmental one and when people are marginalized, when people are left by the wayside, 
uh, then it creates a real issue because it leads to homelessness, uh, brain drain, you know, and then governments has to, governments have to, you know, then look for money for welfare, and it puts pressure on governments, and it put pre puts pressure on societies, and there's crime and all kinds of things. So once we uh, work towards this common goal of equality, then you know, the society is in a much better place, and that's the work that I do. Thank you. Thank you, Donia. And it's really inspiring that you go beyond on what is expected of an activist. You actually ask the difficult questions. And I really like that. The fact that you visit churches, which itself sounds controversial, oh, yeah. but it's very necessary. So I really, really thank you for bringing that up. But also we have Daniela. Daniela, please take the floor. I take the floor. <laughs> <laughs> 57, but trust me, I'm still 15 in my brain. So, <laughs> um, who am I? In 57, I've been wearing so many hats. Um, I am a child, six years old, who runs with her bike in the countryside of northeast of Italy. And after 20 days, she becomes paraplegic due to a very rare cancer. I am a person who has been empowered by her par parents through education. There were no laws at that time, no rights for children with disabilities to attend ordinary school, and yet my parents found a way for me to be educated. And they said, once you become an adult, you have been empowered, now it's your turn to empower us. So who am I today? I am a woman. I have a very enriched life. I have an extremely demanding profession. I lead a division at the United Nations in New York that deals with the social policy and social development. And this division within the Department of Economic and Social Affairs hosts the focal points for the whole United Nations system on youth, older persons, persons with uh, disabilities, indigenous peoples, and the family, including also cooperatives and uh, social enterprises. To do what? To try to uh, give advice and share knowledge with governments on how to eradicate poverty, which is not only economic poverty, you see. Poverty can be also lack of education, lack of health. There are many ways of being poor. It's not just money. Um, promote and give advice to find the jobs and decent work. Promote and give advice about finding ways uh, to promote, as I said, inclusion and integration of these minority groups, as you said earlier, that are not so much minority, if you think of that. Seven billion people, inhabitants of this planet, of which more than one billion out of seven have a disability. 80% living in developing countries and approximately 20% in developed countries. So the needs differ. Um, 600 million youth in the Commonwealth, just in the Commonwealth. More than 50% of the world population is female. Older persons in the world are 1.23 billion, and in the next 30 years, the majority of the world population will be old, meaning people will be older than 60 years, 67% of which will be living in Asia and the Pacific region, while, as you said, Africa is the only continent that keeps growing in terms of youth. By the year 2100, there will be additional 420 million youth people. For us at the United Nations, youth is, goes from the age of uh, 15 to the age of 24. And what about those 400 million people, indigenous peoples, living in the world? So we're talking here about minorities? Question mark, sorry. So, <laughs> I'm surprised. Um, 
So why am I here today to share with you what happens within this phantomatic, complicated, apparently far from your world called the United Nations. It is an organization where nations unite 193 countries, out of which 53 are from the Commonwealth. They sit around the table and they discuss things related to people, how to improve the well-being, the common wealth of the world and all the populations I just mentioned right now. It's a tough world there, you know? Because when you have to find a common denominator about religions, values, uh, different food we eat, uh, different climate, and then we meet there and we discuss and we give advice, recommendations, and then member states discuss all of these things in the intergovernmental mechanisms, the commissions, the Economic and Social Council of Ministers, and then up, 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 to the General Assembly, where member states meet and they discuss our recommendations. And after long negotiations, they go on and on and on, day and night, when they are exhausted, they decide that it is time to find a common denominator. And there we have a resolution, that's a mandate, to try to improve things in the world. This is in a simple way, and, you know, I described to you in, in a simple manner what the United Nations is. So imagine an association. Every association in the world, you know, deals with uh, people and, and has a charter and principles. Those who want to be part of that association become members. So you need to have a president. You need to have a secretary general. And you pay a fee. But once you meet during the, gen during the assembly of your association, then members go home after they have paid the fee and they discuss what is the program for the next coming year. With that fee, you pay some people who have to carry on the work, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing. And that's your role. Your role is to make sure that you become very good in knowing what the United Nations, these 193 countries are doing, because you are one citizen of one of those 193 countries. Citizens have to be educated. They have to know what tools exist. And then with those tools, the citizens have to, I would say, support the endeavors of their countries to implement what has been decided at international level. I will say more later on. Thank you. <laughs> Daniela, thank you for not only taking the floor, but also landing the UN right at the corner of today's talk. I think we all really feel like we want to get to know UN, but right away, we really don't understand the structure just yet. So we're really happy to have you here today. Last but not least, Nikki. Nikki, please take the floor. <laughs> hey. Um, like Hakwaite, Nikki Fraser, and Squas to Kamloopsa Sekwin. I just introduced myself in my, my language. I am from Canada. I'm a Sekwetmik person from the interior of British Columbia, Canada, which is on the west side of the country. And I like that question, who am I? I am first and foremost a woman, an indigenous woman. I am a mom. I have two beautiful children. And that is why I started to do the work that I do, because I became a mom. And I want exactly what you said in the beginning in your talk is you want to leave the world better than you came into it. And having children and seeing the way it was, the community the way it was, I definitely didn't want to raise mm -hmm. my children in a, in a community like that. I wanted my children to be raised in a world where they're valued and appreciated as indigenous people. So that's where my work really stemmed from. I'm a, I advocate for indigenous women and girls and their rights. And my work stemmed from ending violence against indigenous women and girls in Canada, and um, which they just recently launched the inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. 80% um, of indigenous women and girls will experience some sort of violence in their lifetime. And um, that's a huge percentage. And all too often, their voice is left out of the conversation and are not included when they make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, changes and so that's where I really 
wanted to make sure that I would create space so that these voices can be heard. And people tell me, oh, you bring, you're, you bring our voice to the table, and I'm like, no, 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 I want to create room and space so that your voice can be heard at the table, too. So that's what I do, and um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Nikki. Um, you touched upon something that personally resides with me a lot, is the fact that inclusion only gets damaged when we allow it to happen, when we provide space for people to discriminate against one another. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, this is really inspiring because you wanted to get out of your comfort zone. And this is why we all are here. We are really out of our comfort zone. The fact that we talk, we debate, and we talk about crucial stuff that actually normally I really don't want to talk about sometimes. So thank you for actually bringing the bravery into this discussion. Yes. <laughs> um, we had two questions, but because of shortage of time, um, I'm going to collaborate them together. So I have one question on my behalf. Then afterwards, we have two inspiring speakers at the audience that will take the floor. And afterwards, you have as much time, or well, not as much, um, as much as possible time uh, to ask questions to our inspiring speakers. So my question to you is, how do we support young people when achieving inclusion? And what strategies you found successful when campaigning for equality? Ankit, can I start with you? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll take the second question first. What strategy? Uh, I think uh, there are two things very, very clearly. First, uh, you know, when, when, when I started campaigning for equality for persons with disability, I think the first thing that, that comes as a good strategy is create noise. Mm -hmm. It may sound to be very awkward, but unfortunately what we find, and, and, and I'm talking it across the Commonwealth or across the globe, that politicians unfortunately do not listen to voice of people with disabilities because maybe they are not their right constituents, they are not their vote banks. So the first important strategy is to create noise. And that is the only way you can get your voice heard. We, we are living in an age of social media, I think, which is a very, very big tool for us to create noise. Second thing is, a second strategy would be, only creating noise doesn't work. You have to do the actual work after that. Second strategy that I really found is that do not, do not depend on charity. Because charity is not sustainable. You know, I, I really liked uh, the comment that Jamaican president made this morning. You know, he said, do not treat things as charity. It's an investment. So, you know, do your campaigns such that they are sustainable. I don't want to be, you know, just applauding myself, but the way we did our thing, our business, we created hyper-local sustainable business opportunity. What we did is that we provided visually impaired people with seed funding, and we made sure that they give us the money back because we don't want to give away charity. We want their skin in the business so that they are serious about it. We are skilling them. We are investing in them, and we, we take that money back. Obviously, we, we, we you know, provide them money at a soft loan, as a soft loan on low interest rate, but we want that money back. So the business, so, so the campaigns that you create for inclusion should be, should be sustainable. It can't go on, on charity forever. Second question is that how we support young people fighting for inclusion? For those of you who have not, you know, thought about inclusion ever, I think there are two things that, you know, I, I speak on behalf of persons with disabilities particularly. First is challenge your mindsets. Challenge your mindset and challenge others' mindset. You know, the connotation, so I ask you a question, very, very straightforward question, just answer that question to yourself. What is the general emotion or general feelings that comes to your mind when you see maybe a visually impaired person or a person with disability on the street? Maybe uh, the feelings of sympathy, maybe the feelings of helplessness. I think this, this mindset has to go. Do you ever think that that person can be talented enough? Rarely we do. 
So I think we need to attack that mindset. You know, I give you a, a small example from my own experience. A few days back, uh, I met somebody, you know, uh, in the first instance, the person was shocked to hear that I worked for Standard Chartered Bank. Second question, can you imagine uh, when he came to know that, you know, I, I'm married. So he asked me a question, uh, is your wife also visually impaired? I said, seriously? I said, no. <laughs> so uh, I have a kid also. The person went ahead and said, I hope your kid is OK. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> so I mean, but you know, that, that made, left me thinking something that this is the mindset that prevails in the society till today. And we are talking of a young mm -hmm. generation. So I think we are the young generation who can really, you know, change this mindset, and we should work towards that. S second, you know, important thing is that wherever you work, you work for organizations, you work for NGOs, you work for developmental bodies, you work for corporates, you work for government, please, please try and include disability agenda mm -hmm. on your diversity and inclusion agenda. Often we feel that, you know, D&I and I agenda is mostly uh, rotated around women empowerment, which, which I think is absolutely necessary. But get the disability agenda on your D&I &D agenda, on your boardrooms agendas, because until and unless we don't have it on the agenda, we can't have discussions around that. And until and unless we don't have discussions, we can't have policies. So th th that's, that's something I have for young people to say. Please, please get it uh, on the discussion table in your respective organizations. I think that's it. Thank you, Ankit God, I can't speak today. Um, Samson, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Um, to the second, well, the first, how do you support young people who, um, either work in to promote inclusion. I think the very first point is around values. Um, if you're involved in advocacy for inclusion, um, what values underpin that advocacy effort um, that you seek to, to achieve? Uh, and for me, it's about our values, the values of integrity, the values of accountability, and the values of transparency. Um, is very, very critical at the center of the work that we do. And so continually encouraging young people to engage in value-based advocacy and value-based engagement is more critical. The second is the need for us to, to dislodge this silo mentality that exists within the youth movement um, or the inclusion movement, where we see ourselves as competitors rather than collaborators. And that's something we must uh, actually address. And the place of solidarity is very, very key in, in, in this movement, either the youth movement, the women movement, or the movement of persons with disability, or even the LGBT uh, movement. It's, it's very, very critical. We need to support each other. We need to tell the stories of others while we tell our own stories. Mm -hmm. And then we need to ensure that we, we, we we, we, promote, we promote what we do in whatever space that we find um, ourselves. And then to the, to the second um, question about strategies. First, one of the things that we've, we've come to appreciate in the Not Too Young to Run movement is the power of the narrative. The power of the narrative. How do you frame the issue in a way that it accesses the emotions of people and it pushes them to act. It's very, very critical. And that's the place of storytelling. It is very, very important that we, we reflect and spend a lot of time in designing the power of narrative. Not Too Young to Run Today, before it became a global movement, actually started 10 years ago. But we, it, wasn't, it didn't take the form of Not Too Young to Run until 2016 before we framed it around Not Too Young to Run and now building into um, Ready to Run. The, the second point is about movements. We need to build movements around the issues that we promote. If you're in politics or you're interested in politics, the, the, the trend and the emerging trend 
it's now about movements and not political parties. And these movements have to be value-based movements. Um, we need to ensure that we establish very strong partnerships and relationships that keeps us together if we want to disrupt the political space or we even want to disrupt the economic space because our generation is about disruption and positive disruption. And to do so, movements are very, very critical. And that's why it's important this conversation of inclusion is it's being held at this particular um, critical um, moment. The, the, the last point is about the most important and powerful tool that we have, which is social media. And I'll just end by telling you a story. In Nigeria, um, this was a constitutional amendment. One of the state parliaments, the sub-regional parliament, had voted no to Not Too Young to Run because the parliament was made up of older politicians um, who didn't want young people to get into politics. And we know that naming and shaming is a new is a form of social control, and what we did was to establish a hall of fame and a hall of shame, and all the parliaments that voted yes, we put them in the hall of fame, and all those that voted no, we put them in the hall of shame, and one particular legislature was in the hall of shame, and we used social media and used the press, um, and there was a lot of pressure, friends. In 48 hours, the parliament reconvened itself <laughs> and reversed the vote, and they all voted unanimously <laughs> to pass the legislation. And the point is, there's so much, colleagues, we can achieve if we are united. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can achieve. All the challenges that confront us as, as, as a generation can be surmounted if we, if we build cohesion. And I'm glad that the Commonwealth is putting this together because this is about building that strong one voice mm -hmm. to dislodge the challenges that befall us as a people. Thank you. Thank you, Samsung. I would really love to make a comment on how amazing the idea was, but we have, we're short on time, so I would swiftly move to Donia. Um, please. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll make this short uh, in the interest of inclusion, and I didn't know that everybody else wants to have a, have a say. Um, one thing that struck me when I heard this, um, when I heard the question, and uh, Samsung alluded to it a little bit when he spoke about uh, about collaboration, and that is intersectionality, and how we need to recognize that we don't live in silos. And you know, I am I'm a lesbian, but I'm also a woman, and I'm also black. And because of this, the the solidarity that we need as a people, mm -hmm. you know, e even with my movement, it's just important. Allies are very, very important. And you know, when we move together, there's a there's a African saying that that goes. If you want to move fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you, you, you move together. Mm. And, and that's important when, when we're doing the work that we do, because if I'm marginalized as a lesbian, I'm not only marginalized as a lesbian, but I'm marginalized as a woman at the same time. And so fighting for indigenous rights and, and the rights of um, women is something that is important to me, and the rights of black people is important to me. But not only that, you know, there are issues of, you know, there are other issues that I might not be directly connected to, but because people are oppressed, and I am somebody who has been oppressed, I, should, I can somewhat identify with that oppression and work with people in order to make these movements happen. And it's important that our work is intersectional and we work with each other. As civil society and a as activists, we show up for, for each other and, 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 we, and we use our platforms to not only advance our own causes, but the causes of others. One thing that... Um, that struck me the other day. We were uh, at the act, one of the action plans breakout sessions, and uh, I and another colleague we wanted to get LGBT rights in that in that communication, and there was another another young lady there. She wanted to get the the issues of women and girls in 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 sub-Saharan Africa in the communication, and you know. Initially, you know, we were both trying to, to make our points clear, 
But then it was, it was absolutely clear to me that we combined them and in the end, the communication was uh, around LBT women yeah. as well as um, women and girls in, in Africa. So, we, so we, we were able to combine that and it, was, and it was a good feeling knowing that we could have just come together and make that happen. And so I guess the real issue here is we, oppression, oppression affects us all in different ways and these are things that we must remember when we're advocating and even if you're not an activist even if you're not a part of a civil society organization it is important that you you show up you show up for those causes and you you're involved mm -hmm. and I want to implore you to get involved in, in in your local communities even if you're in a position of privilege especially if you're in a position of privilege uh, I think that you owe it to the communities around you and the communities that affect you to, to show up for other people and to champion and to use that privilege to help those that are oppressed. Daniela, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Support youth in achieving inclusion, and I would say how youth can support member states and their governments actually to achieve inclusion. Uh, you, you have the power. <laughs> I am empowering you. So, <laughs> how? Um, at the United Nations, these 193 countries in the year 2015 decided to, to adopt 17 goals. These are 17 goals are called sustainable development goals. So what I do um, with the division I lead, we try to bridge the gap between human rights, because for human rights to be implemented, you need policies. So that's what I do. I facilitate member states to discuss about strong policy frameworks to be implemented, to, you know, uh, to be utilized at national level for then rights, any kind of rights, in this case human rights, to be implemented. Otherwise, rights are written in books and books are in bookshelves. So we need to understand the tools we have at our disposal to support our countries to implement the policies that they have decided at international level, in this case at the United Nations. I am a strong believer of multilateralism. Multilateralism is key. This is what's happening here. So in 2015, 193 countries decided to put these 17 sustainable development goals in what they call the 2030 agenda, mm -hmm. meaning that these goals should be ideally achieved by the year 2030. The first one, which is also the overarching theme of the 2030 agenda, while in Africa there is the 2063 agenda, so it's much more developed yeah. actually, very ambitious. Um, so um, we have these 17 goals and the overarching goal, goal number one, the one about poverty, touches all the others. And in these 17 goals, most of the social groups we have been discussing about are mentioned or explicitly included. Mm -hmm. So I would like to show you very briefly uh, slide number 11, the one on the infographics on disability. <coughs> there it is. So there you have mentioned in which goals uh, persons with disabilities are clearly indicated. And then we have also 169 different targets to measure the implementation of the goals. And then we do have also, I, I brought with me another infographic, the one uh, 13, please. Youth. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, these are the goals. Look how many where we can find, if not exactly the word youth, but definitely they refer to young people. And then slide, the, the, the other one, uh, I think is number 12 uh, on indigenous peoples. Yes. 
And th this is, for instance, where indigenous peoples are explicitly referred in the SDGs. Thank you. So this is the way we try to include all the things we have been discussing about in the various dimensions in a holistic manner. The social dimension, the economic dimension, the environmental dimension, the cultural dimension, the political, the policy dimension. All these dimensions are one in nature. But we human beings, because it's easier to deal with, we have split them in, in, in silos, as you said mm -hmm. earlier on. But in reality, nature, it's all one. So this is the way youth could support their countries. Helping your countries to implement the 17 goals they agreed upon. These goals are universal. They apply to developed and developing countries. And member states in 2015 agreed that in implementing these goals, they have to be accountable. Help your countries. Don't put barriers. Don't create conflicts. Mm -hmm. Find policies and strategies at grassroots level and at the various levels mm -hmm. to support the endeavors of your countries. Be heard as leaders. You can lead at home, you can lead at school, you can lead as a politician. A leader doesn't need to be the one sitting on the big chair, right? Mm -hmm. We can be leaders in so many different ways. So lead this process in your countries. Lead the implementation of these 17 goals. Lead the implementation of the 2030 agenda. And, and this is the strategy I would suggest to um, reach inclusion leaving no one behind, mm -hmm. leaving no one behind not only in terms of people, but also leaving not, without leaving behind the private sector. You have to work with the private sector, mm -hmm. promote these goals with the private sector, work with the academia, work with the civil society, NGOs, etc. all included, no one left behind. And, uh, and the same applies to countries. Some countries might be a little bit behind other countries, Support to those countries as well, mm -hmm. right? This is the unity, united, as you said. I'm very proud to work at the United Nations. <laughs> so <laughs> so let's, let's be united. And, um, and this is more or less, yes, what I want to say. Three I's. The first I, inclusion. The, third, the second I, inequalities, reduction of inequalities. And the last I is impact. That's what we need to do. Enough with talking. Let's take some action. Pick up one goal. And of that goal, pick up one target. And united, mm -hmm. try to make that happen. In this way, you show you have the ability to lead. And therefore, when it comes my turn to vote you, I will see that you are not able to talk mainly about youth. But as a leader, you keep take into consideration everybody. You leave no one behind. Older people, persons with disabilities, indigenous people, women, girls, boys, etc., etc. And do what usually indigenous peoples do. Whenever they take a decision, they think that what kind of impact that decision will have on the next coming seven, seven generations. generations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nikki, please take the floor. Uh, wow, these answers were so incredible. I was legit taking notes and like agreeing. You guys are very phenomenal. And um, so the first question was, how do we support young people to achieve inclusion. It's by giving them the space and giving them that platform and giving them that opportunity to have a voice and to share their truths and to share their realities. Um, and not it not be a token spot. Oh, we have a young person at the table. They're, to really value their voice to so that they're heard and that they're, the voices that they do bring to that table are heard as well. So I feel like that's how we can start 
by creating space so that our, our young people and marginalized groups like indigenous people have that space to share mm -hmm. and have input and that they're valued. Um, I like that you've uh, mentioned, um, you know, breaking down the silos and being a part of movements and then that they're interconnected. I'm a UN Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals and goal number five is something that is um, gender equality. And that's something I see at a different level with an indigenous point of view when it comes to, I'm a woman, mm. but I'm an indigenous woman. And so it just feels like my uphill ba battle has just gone harder. So the goals I like about the goals is that you can't achieve one without achieving the other. And that's the same thing when you work with allies and grassroots movements, you join together, you can achieve equality for all. So working with other, mm -hmm. other groups is something I really, really like and agree with. Because that's, when she mentioned that earlier, I was like, yes, that's right. So yeah, that's, <laughs> Perfect. yeah. Thank you very much. Just before you all prepare your questions for our amazing panel, I would like to first invite Natombi and Stephen uh, to take the floor for two minutes, as short as possible, but enough detail that it intrigues all of us. Um, they, well, they, they grew up in an orphanage, which to me, I didn't know until an hour ago about the amazing work that they do. So we all are really extremely looking forward to hear what they do when it comes to orphanage and how they experience when it comes to integrating into the community. So Natombe, can you raise your hand um, and, and we will be able to give you a mic. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, as she has said that my name is Dombe Koyi um, from South Africa. Um, I just want to thank the Commonwealth Youth Forum for giving me the opportunity to stand before you and just um, introduce the subject about uh, growing up in an orphanage. Um, so just to paint a picture, imagine yourself in a cage for 10 years. Everything gets handed to you uh, you don't make decisions over what you like, what you don't like, um, and it's, you're not in a family setup. We all know that being in a family is important. It helps you get it, that sense of belonging. So once you're old, at the age of 18, you get released into the community and that you need to make it for yourself. You need to be an adult now, you need to live your own life, and you have no idea how to do that. And it's, so, it's such a silent issue that people actually in the community don't even understand why you are not able to function in the community. And your family is still dysfunctional, you're not able to go back into your family, so you are literally an island. You feel isolated. Some experience a whole lot of mental issues. So, um, and I believe in family. I believe family is important because fortunately I've experienced being in a foster family and they've loved me, they've been my support and I'm the person I am today because I've been in a family. Um, so I just want to um, encourage all of you guys really to look into this. It's an important issue for deinstitutionalization of children and young people. We need them to be in families, not in institutions. Thank you so much for giving me this time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Just to clarify to you, um, she's also available to answer questions, but if you're gonna ask a question, please clarify it is um, for her to answer so she can um, answer it for you. Um, our second speaker is Navir, who has worked a lot when it comes to um, international migration labor. So um, Navi will talk about migrant workers and their situation when it comes to labor and finding work. So Navi, can you show your hands where you are so we can give you a mic? No? They have left? So 
if any of you see Nave coming, please let us know so we can have Nave speaking about his work. Okay, so can I have three questions? And if you keep it as short as possible, we can take more. Um, just uh, I want to make sure that we have enough time to answer your three questions. So can I have you here? Um, the lady at the front and also gentleman right at back. Please take the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. My question is, uh, is there a conversation between the left and the right wing important in the 21st century? And also, is there any positive learning outcome of such dialogues in countries like Jamaica, Nigeria, or coming down to Southeast Asia like Pakistan and India? Thank you. Can you please take note of your... Can the second speaker please take the mic? Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Salia Rashid. Uh, I'm here uh, as an ambassador from the charity Include Me Too. Uh, I'm also uh, blind as well, so it's really great to see so many uh, people and, and representation of disabled people, and especially people from developing countries, because you are role models for us, and do not let your society or communities tell you that you can't achieve because you can, and you just prove that right here now. Um, my question to you is um, about SDG 5, which it looks at gender equality. And I was wondering what your views might be about, because we all know women, uh, the, about the oppression of women, but the oppression of disabled women who face additional uh, challenges uh, and barriers. So in your view, what can we do to overcome that? Thank you. Please. Can you please? Hi everyone, my name is Darian Ryan from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, my question to the entire panel is, uh, what have you all done or how can you all, uh, what, what do you suggest, uh, some of the methods that you can use to sensitize individuals who might not share the same views to your cause, especially um, those, the groups that are, are majorly marginalized there. Because even in the workplaces, even around the, um, in schools, whatever the case may be. Sometimes there's a fear. I've even seen a fear with people trying having just basic communication or interactions, especially with people who are disabled. They're afraid to go and have those conversations. So what, or even with, with those who are part of the LGBTQI group. So what do you all suggest um, and what have you all done to basically sensitize individuals or what do you all suggest to those who are uh, promoting this or pushing for this cause that they can do to also sensitize those individuals and bring them to understanding that we're all equal out there and it's just a cool vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like me to clarify the question for you? Um, Nikki, please, you can ask all, all three questions or you can choose the one you think uh, best and you can answer. Okay, so, um, I definitely want to answer um, the question about SDG 5. Um, thank you again for your question and thanks for being here. Um, disability challenges, especially when it comes to women, and I, I know the, the oppression and what that feels like. So um, how I overcame being an indigenous woman and making sure that my voice was heard at the table was, you know, demanding it and, and saying my voice is valuable I bring certain things to the table and I bring a different view and a different lifestyle and I have my own truth so making sure that I was in, at the table or ensuring other indigenous women were at the table if I couldn't physically be there myself so thanks for your question Thank you. um, Daniela please <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Mm, the first one, SDG 5, it's not one of those SDGs I work on, mm -hmm. um, meaning gender balance. I mean, we do work on gender balance. We do not work specifically on women. Um, 
and the question was about uh, pers women, wi women with a disability who suffer from multiple discrimination. Mm -hmm. Mm, this is a topic that has been uh, discussed by member states. Now, when there is discrimination on, on women, still a lot, and violence, mm -hmm. and we're still discussing about that to find solutions and change uh, cultural attitudes, yeah. the, the answer is even more complicated when it comes to women who have a disability because discussions are still going on about including persons, about persons with disabilities, um, you know, being included in, in the society, so you can imagine. And then if you have to deal with a, a woman with a dis disability who is young, or even the old, or actually the old ones even more, often they might end up in institutions for various reasons, and they're, uh, they're really treated badly, and they suffer from lots of um, kinds of violence, psychological, physical, uh, sexual abuse, it's, it's really tough. Um, so what we are doing at the United Nations, and again, I'm asking you youth to be engaged on this as well. Um, we every year meet um, to discuss about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This year it takes place from the 12th to the 14th of June. So if you can't physically come to the United Nations in, in New York, use your media, use the social media to connect and, and to spread the voice. Mm -hmm. One of the topics that is going to be discussed is about women and girls with disabilities. Plus, we have prepared many Secretary General reports showing what the situation is in the world about women and girls with disabilities and recommendations that have been adopted by member states. So, you know, you yourself have to make the effort to uh, learn what exists, which tools you have. You know, there are rights, rights uh, of youth, but youth also has, has duties. One of your duties is to make sure that you know what's available. Research, discuss, share. What you're learning here, share, share it. Mm -hmm. So this is a quick question I want to uh, answer. I wanted to ask for the fear. Uh, again, persons with disabilities were mentioned. Think of stories, uh, you know, um, uh, stories that we t um, share to kids. How are they called in English? Fairy tales? Yeah. Yeah. I think of the story of Pinocchio. I'm Italian. Pinocchio was written by an Italian. Mm -hmm. And who were the enemies of Pinocchio? Are you familiar with Pinocchio? The guy who was telling lies and the nose was going long and long? Okay. And the enemies are a cat and a fox. And guess what? The fox is half visually impaired or blind, and, and the other one has, uh, has, um, has an issue with the leg. Has a, both have a disability, so deformity of the body means deformity of the soul. Mm. Uh, but think of Captain Hook, bad. And again, another disability. Deformity of the body is deformity of the soul. And I could tell you many more of these uh, stories, that we, we are taught these uh, stories since we're kids. And that's where we start building up our prejudice and the fear. <laughs> it's ugly. <laughs> okay, so it, this is where it starts from. So media, the way we communicate, the stories we teach, uh, the language we use, uh, mm -hmm. we have to start from there. Mm -hmm. And you will see that fear dissipates. Thank you. I like what you said uh, about that. I mean, I never thought about it that way. And yeah, I see it a lot in, in media. Um, to answer the question with regards to the LGBTQ community, um, it's a real interesting question because, you know, working with the public is not easy. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I always, that I, like, even before, especially when, before I go to churches, uh, I, always, um, I always try to remember that, you know, people are victims of their circumstances and products of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And just like beginning a lesson in algebra, we're not gonna be able to get it one time. And it's, it's important, a, a fellow activist um, told me that, you know, anger is a, is a natural reaction to oppression. 
And as activists, sometimes we let this anger seep in so mm -hmm. deeply mm -hmm. and we are very aggressive in our approach sometimes. And this is an issue that I have with other activists, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in trying to get it to get it right and to be able to relate to people in ways that they understand that is not condescending, that is not that is not fueled and with anger because you know people are people and once you give somebody anger and you are aggressive towards someone they will be just as aggressive back and it's not the place and it's not a position that you want to be in if you want to get a message across mm -hmm. so it's always important to you know check ourselves we are as as the lgbt as a part of the lgbt community have been oppressed and that oppression you know manifest itself in different ways whether it's anger or sadness but these are things that we have that i personally have to work through when i'm talking to people and i always try to do it in a way that you know brings about peace and brings about harmony and listening because oftentimes you know we're experts in our field and we want to talk and we want to you know you know get our points across and make sure that this person understands but the first thing that we must do is to listen. Sometimes people are offensive. Sometimes, you know, they're misinformed. But again, we go back to the first thing, is that people are uh, only a product of their circumstances. And that, if that is a situation where, you know, they have, you know, they've grown up. I mean, we've all vilified, um, I've grown up seeing uh, LGBT people as bad people. You know, and I had, I personally had to deal with that and try to, you know, unpack that personally, but understand that the other person is going to see me as that person. So as a representative, I have a lot of responsibility about, as it relates to how I treat others and how others perceive me. And not that LGBT people are, we're people. You know, and they're good people, they're bad people. They're loud people, they're quiet people. And there's no, oh, I've heard it a lot, you know, oh, LGBT people are so nice, but they're so, you know, they're so friendly. They're people. So you're going to find friendly ones, and you're going to find, yeah. you know, just like anybody else. So, you know, it's just important that I check my behavior and my level of, and I come with a level of understanding, you know, knowing that people sometimes don't know. And this, is what gets me through. I mean, oftentimes, you know, it still hurts, you know, when I go to places and people are offensive and people are unkind and it takes a level, a level of spirit to, to not retaliate, to not be angry the same way. But I know that I am doing this and as an advocate, I have come here with a purpose and that purpose is to show mutual understanding and love. And that's how I do it. Have you seen that? Samsung, please. I, I think my response will perhaps just to the first speaker about the conversations around right wing and, and left wing. Um, I think those conversations are, are very, very critical. But then again, it's, it's contingent on the dominant political ideology in a particular space. Um, but, but I just like to say this, that we are all witnesses to the fact that we're experiencing democratic recession across the world. And democracy is under threat. Colleagues, the greatest threat to democracy is not fake news as much as fake news is a threat. The greatest threat to democracy is that those of us in this room who are eligible to vote and refuse to show up on election day to vote are actually the greatest threat of democracy. Because what, what, what we see happen is governments being instituted that are not in any way legitimate or do not enjoy the support of the majority of the people. And that's why across the world today when we talk about democratic recession, it's about those of us who are eligible to vote who don't go out to vote. And so I urge you colleagues that we should vote at elections in our member countries and wherever we find ourselves because politics is everything and politics is critical. And so that conversation is very, very important. 
So I would like to take the second question on uh, women with disabilities, because that's a sector we work very closely with. So the NGO that I devote my time is uh, National Association for the Blind, Center for Blind Women and Disability Studies. So, uh, you know, just to give you a background, uh, I, can, I can relate to your question very well, because we know that when it comes, obviously people with disabilities are marginalized, but when it comes to women with disabilities, the problem is definitely aggravated. So, you know, we had a study some, you know, many years back uh, in that NGO, where we studied the status of blind women in the developing countries. So very, very uh, you know, surprising facts came out. Uh, we found stories of uh, you know, blind women being gifted away as a truzo with her sighted sister to the same man because the family could not understand what to do with a blind girl. Actually, you know, these were the kind of uh, reports that came out of that study. There are no quick fixes, but we, what we try to do at the NGO is, you know, I have, I have one universal solution to that, is that invest in education of those girls. Mm. Because until the, unless the girls are not educated, they can't be economically empowered. And if you don't economically empower a girl, I mean, and, and a girl with disability, I'm sure at point of time, she is going to be a sexual object, I'm telling you. So th this, this is something we have observed. This is something we have learned through our experience in the organization. So we, 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 you know, every year we churn out, I mean, we, we educate close to 100 girls. Every year we, uh, we educate them, we, we send them to colleges, we help them place with different organizations. And, you know, when, once they are economically empowered, so, you know, their life becomes far more easier. I have seen those girls getting married, happily married, well settled, they're economically empowered, m much more confident. So, you know, the only answer to that question is invest in education, invest in education. Thank you to our panelists, but the sad news is we're running out of time. We're actually running over, um, which is sad news because I wanted to um, hear more questions from you. But uh, I'm sure the panelists will be more than available to um, answer questions if you do approach them after this. But to conclude with this, we have heard that this problem does exist. But I would say the world is going through a huge renovation, in my opinion. There's a lot of things that through generations have gone wrong and we have let that happen. But what the good news, in my opinion, is that our generation is so eager to change those and to set new milestones. So my request to you is after this session, please question how much and to what extent you want to change the community that you live in. If it doesn't affect you, please, affect, please make the changes for those that are affected by it. And please use our networks across the Commonwealth Youth Human Rights, Dem uh, Human Rights Democracy Network and other networks that work towards cutting prejudice and bringing inclusion back to the Commonwealth where it belongs. So this is all I can say to you. And please, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.